here it is, week three. This was supposed to be our last week doing this way back two weeks ago when we all hoped for us to be back in church by the time Palm Sunday rolled around. But as you probably beginning to suspect, this social distancing will be longer than just the extended March break that the Ontario government proposed. We are all coming to grips with the thought that we will be distancing through Easter and April and maybe even longer than that. I was just on a Zoom meeting this morning where we were making alternative plans to do the business of the region because the regional meeting planned for the end of May will not be happening in person. But please be assured that even though we are not meeting face to face, we are here. The church is still here. We are still connected. We can be with each other online or on the phone or in our thoughts and in our prayers and we will worship together. Each week we will continue to have online worship with scripture and sermon and prayer. We are looking into ideas around a Facebook Live Easter Sunrise service, a Zoom call communion where we can share the cup and break the bread and share the meal together. I am also going to be having short daily reflections during Holy Week because in spite of it all, Jesus will rise and Easter will happen. I can guarantee it. So join the Facebook pages, either the Southampton United Church Facebook page or the Knox Paisley United Church Facebook page, and subscribe to the Southampton United Church YouTube channel so you don't miss any of these opportunities. So let us worship. Gather in. You are welcome here. Come and listen to the good news. In the world, there are so many discouraging and negative voices, so much anxiety and fear. So breathe. God is with us. The God of encouragement will speak to us today. The God of Jesus Christ is with us in this moment. So be here. Breathe. Relax. Let your worries roll away. Lift up your hearts and come into this time of worship. A reading from the Gospel of John, and this is a variety of verses. Now a certain man was ill. He was Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, Martha, and to Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed Jesus with perfume, wiped his feet with her hair, and her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. After having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming for the world. Then she said this, and she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And he said to her, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. 
Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and his feet were bound with strips of cloth and his face was wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Have you noticed that our culture is fascinated with the undead? You know what I mean? The vampires and zombies that are filling up our primetime television spots. Zombies and mummies and Frankenstein-like creatures that have popula populated the boxes of video games. The ghosts and ghouls that float through our best-selling literature. What is it about the undead that captures our attention so thoroughly? Our fascination extends beyond the life of fiction as well. Did you know that there's an entrepreneur in Detroit who is seeking to build a zombie theme park in the downtown core? And I quote, to help bring life back to the city. There is even a course at the University of Detroit in Michigan called Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse. And doesn't it feel like a zombie apocalypse right now with all the deserted streets, panic buying in the grocery stores, social distancing and civil emergency alert warnings coming across our telephones, warning all people coming into Ontario to go straight home. Do not go to a grocery store. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Rising fascination with the undead corresponds to a time in our culture when we are living in the midst of rapid change, all sorts of uncertainty and lack of confidence in the future. We don't know what the news will bring one day to the next. There is within our society a deep-seated anxiety, fear, disappointment, a sense of disempowerment, and a high anxiety over the large global problems which are too big to comprehend. For all around us, we are witnessing our neighbors and us shut up in our homes, grocery shelves being cleared, a national crisis, municipal states of emergency being declared last week, this global pandemic, rising numbers of the infected, rising numbers of the dead, anxiety and fear are abounding. What used to be predictable no longer can be counted on. With so much around us in collapse, it is easier to respond to the global crisis by being dead or undead. It may be a gruesome impulse, but sometimes what else is there to do? When we lose, when, when the losses we face feel like death, becoming a zombie may be a relief. For if we are undead, then we can ignore all the suffering. We can not see the despair. We can forget about the fear. We can close our eyes to the anxiety that surrounds us. Because if we are undead, we can go through life on automatic pilot focused only on our bodily needs and our bodily functions, eating, sleeping. We can ignore the world around us by not seeing the suffering of others and deaden the pain of our own suffering. We can focus only on survival, food, water, shelter, entertainment. We can care only about our needs or the needs of our families. If we do this, we don't really need to think. We don't need to be engaged. We don't need to feel the pain and sorrow in our lives or witness to any suffering in the world. And the pandemic going on outside our doors right now is just a blip on the nightly news as we medicate with more Netflix binging or an extra glass of Chardonnay. If we are undead, then we do not need to get involved because it doesn't concern us. But this is not life. This is not a good way. This is not why we are here on this earth. This is not how God wants us to live. God does not want this to be our lives. So then, how can we be resuscitated? How can we be restored? What can enliven us? What can revive us? Where can we find life? 
Jesus friend Lazarus brother to Martha and Mary is dying and when Jesus receives word of this he does not feel the urgency of the message quite so much as Martha and Mary do textual point here God comes in God's time not on the time of our own human agendas Jesus continues to follow his previous plan and remains an extra two days in the place where he was it takes him four days from the death of Lazarus for Jesus to arrive by this time, the family and the community are in full mourning, and the body, it has already been through the rituals of death in his culture. He's been anointed with oils and perfumes. Lazarus has been wrapped in cloth from head to foot. He's been laid in a rock tomb, and the stone has been set in front of it to guard his body from all the carrion creatures that come and want to consume him. By the time Jesus arrives, the body's decon decomposition process has begun. Jillian Barr writes, Martha's description of a four-day dead Lazarus. Already there's a stench, she says. Actually, the King James Version of the Bible says, he stinketh. Lots of things stink, literally or figuratively. The death of a friend, disease-laden drinking water, the smell of gunpowder after a shooting, flop houses and crack houses, bodies on a battlefield, antiseptic in hospitals and the deadly infections it fights, a person living on the streets without a shower. Lots of things stink. There is a stench. Other translations use the word putrid or foul. He stinketh. Only two words, but they say so very much. They stand for all the things in life which indeed reek of death those things which stink to high heaven. Death stinks. But Jesus is not put out or put off. Jesus faces death, the death of a friend, and we know he's also about to face his own death. He faces death square in the face because he knows that there is more at play here than those around him can see. Jesus knows that God is in the midst of this situation, that God is about to do a new thing, that even though death is stinking up the air around him, death is not, is not the final word, and God is not done with him yet. Just because Mary, Martha, and their friends and family are all in deep mourning, just because they are unable to see the divine working and dancing in their midst, it does not mean that God is not working. It does not mean that God is not there. Just because all the evidence points to a conclusion, it does not mean that God does not have a bigger plan in mind and that this ending is actually a beginning, something God alone can see. The problem we as human beings have is our need to think that we know what it is all about. Our need to be certain in our certainties, our need to be absolute in our absolutes. The problem with, with this is that when we are so sure of what is and what isn't and how the world works and how the world does not work, we miss the mystery of our creator and we do not allow for the presence of God to be in our midst. When all we know is what is that what is possible is realistic and reasonable, we limit our lives and we block our ability we block the ability to see the divine, to penetrate into our consciousness so that we can live into the holy mystery. It limits our ability to see God at work in the world, to witness to the new life that is in Christ. For no matter how realistic we think we are, no matter how much we think we know what we know, we do not know it all. And we cannot assume that we know what God is up to. All we can know is that God is up to something. Faith is remembering what we actually know, what really is the truth, that God is God and we are not, that God is with us as close as breath, that it is God who restores life, that God loves us and cares for us and walks with us on all of our journeys, no matter how difficult, no matter how arduous, no matter how complicated, God is with us, and God can open graves, and God can work in our lives unseen, even now, and God 
can work in this world in this time of COVID-19. And I can guarantee you this, that God is working in this world. I promise. What we can know is that whatever it is, God will give birth to more. God will give birth to more love, more life, more grace, more in a hurting world than we can ever imagine. And then, in a loud voice, he cried, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out in his hands and his feet, bound with strips of cloth, and Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. As we creep ever closer to the cross and the tomb, and God calls us to this new life out of death until we arrive on Easter morning with the biggest gift of new life for all time. Look around and see all the signs of new life that are in our midst everywhere. Buds in our gardens and pussy willows by the side of the road, ribbons on trees and teddy bears in windows, care mongers in our communities and social distancing, Facebook Live concerts and healthcare workers and grocery store clerk heroes, God getting into the world, new life being born, love all around. Amen. Our prayer today is from the website World in Prayer. It begins like this. Conversations will not be cancelled. Relationships will not be cancelled. Love will not be cancelled. Songs will not be cancelled. Readings will not be cancelled. Self-care will not be cancelled. Hope will not be cancelled. Let us pray. Beloved, how are we to pray in these times of pandemic when country after country imposes, imposes stringent stay-at-home orders, when schools and restaurants and businesses are closed and all public gatherings banned, when what we do to relax and let go of tension when the ways we come together to celebrate birthdays and weddings and graduations, when what we rely on to grieve and reassure and comfort one another in funerals and hugs and touch, when all these things have been closed off, when life seems to be increasingly put on hold while we shelter in place, and even those who like long stretches of time alone are finding the walls starting to close in. Breathe. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Beloved, how are we to pray when fears start to consume us, when we can't shake our worries about our own safety and the safety of those we love, when we are daily reminded of the risks taken by healthcare workers and grocery store clerks and delivery people and emergency service providers and all other essential personnel, when borders close, when we find shortages in grocery stores and farmers lose their crops, when too many are desperate for income as their workplaces are shut down and jobs eliminated. Breathe. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Beloved, how are we to pray when the number of COVID-19 illness and death keeps rising exponentially? When these stop being safety anonymous numbers and start being stories about real people? Real people whom we know and whom we love, whom have died, whom are sick, Breathe. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Beloved, how are we to pray when there are still those, even among our own families, who believe and spread wild and provably false conspiracy theories, when seemingly rational adults claim they have the right to ignore the personal and public safety rules, when there are handfuls of religious leaders who endanger those they pledge to care for by insisting on holding public worship? When too many government leaders still deny the seriousness of the situation and refuse to act, or demand to put profit before human lives. When there is a real risk in other countries that temporary measures put in place for public safety will lead to, will lead to even more crisis. Breathe. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Beloved, how are we to pray when nearly every country in the world has insufficient COVID-19 tests, medical masks, respirators, ICU beds, morgue space, when many people lack access to even basic medical care or can't afford it, when we know it would take but a single spark to make the epidemic run rampant among the homeless, those in jails, refugee camps, or many other parts of the world that simply can't take basic precautions? Breathe. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Beloved, 
How are we to pray when our lives are so cramped by worries about the virus that we can barely take in the fact that there is a major earthquake in Croatia, that the Great Barrier Reef in Australia has suffered another mass bleaching, that there are rising floodwaters in Manitoba, when we know that there must be so much else going on in the world, both good and bad? Breathe. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Beloved, how are we to pray when we remember that you can and are with us always, that you are full of mercy, no matter whether we are angry, frustrated, fearful, sad, or full of joy. When we believe or so much want to believe that love will not be cancelled, songs will not be cancelled, hope will not be cancelled, when we trust that your love for us will never be cancelled, breathe. Lord, you are full of mercy. Christ, you are full of mercy. Lord, we are filled with your mercy. Breathe. So may God bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you as you go about your week. Amen.